What's up, everybody? I'm Kevin. And I'm Pete. And this is A Zenny, Zenny Saved. Saved. All right, everybody. Happy New Year. We're here with our first or maybe uh, second, depending on if you've been keeping up with this episode of A Zenny Saved. Don't worry. I'm not drinking that guy's sparkling cider to commemorate. What, what are you talking about? The second? New Year. Don't you remember all those amazing adventures we had? Oh, oh yeah. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't remember them. That's because you've been drinking sparkling cider. Hey, I don't have a problem. <laughs> Who does? <laughs> but um, we just wanted to do a 2015 retrospective. And if you don't know what a Zenny Saved is about, this is basically our little uh, video game channel where we talk about games and the way we score them is we talk about what we think you should pay for them. So rather than using a 1 out of 10 or 1 out of 5 star scale or something like that, we tell you, what should you pay for this game? So is this game, you know, a full $60 purchase or is it less than that? Should you wait for this game to come out for on 20 bucks or something like that? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, DLC games, should you pay the asking price, whatever that is, or should you wait for a discount? So, That's right. The nice thing about this retrospective is we're going to be talking about games that definitely at full price were worth it. Yeah. Uh, but we've also got a few games that uh, even if they go down to the penny bin, you maybe should pass it by. Yeah, some games, they, sh they shouldn't even be paying you to play them. You should just keep them moving. Amiibo Festival. It's all right. It'll never be all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're on Team Nintendo. <laughs> Better straighten out. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. What do we got on our list today? Um, I'm going to just run down the list real quick, and then you can run down your list, yes. and then we'll jump in. All right. That sounds good. So my list of the best games for 2015 that I played are Metal Gear Solid V, Bloodborne, Batman Arkham Knight, DMC Devil May Cry Definitive Edition, Rocket League, and Oddworld New and Tasty. Okay, you're going to have to talk about a couple of those selections with me real quick. Oh, I know. Um, but give me your list real quick. All right. My list, uh, again, Metal Gear Solid V, Phantom Pain, phenomenal game. Uh, Tales from the Borderlands uh, is probably yeah. my contender for Game of the Year, to be honest with you. Wow, okay. Uh, Super Mario Maker, Splatoon, I see, we told you we were on Team Nintendo here, and mm -hmm. Star Wars Battlefront, which yeah. I think a lot of people don't necessarily agree with. Yeah, that's interesting. But um, I'll tell you what, I'm not a big Star Wars fan, and I'm not a big multiplayer-only fan, but I've been playing Battle, um, sorry, Battlefront, <laughs> and... It's, I'm having a lot of fun, and it, if nothing else, it's just gorgeous. Like, you get, you drop in the game, and you're just like, wow, this is amazing just to look at, and then you want to you wanna run around and start doing stuff. And I feel like the gunplay and, and such is, is so solid that even if you're on the losing end of a, a game, you feel like it's, it's a fair fight, and, you know, you're still having fun. Like, there's still that fun factor, regardless yeah. of the outcome. Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it's weird because... And this one's developed by DICE, who are prominently known for the Battlefield games. And I hated Battlefield 4. I wasn't um, a fan. I, I hated it. I felt like the gameplay was was bizarre in that guns had good feedback, but it seemed like even if I got somebody in my sights and shot first, I would still get down. No matter yeah. what. Um, but they nailed it for this one. Yeah, like, it is. Absolutely. It is fluid. Uh, I never feel like I'm in a completely unfair fight unless matchmaking goes completely awry. And I'm, like, yeah. on a team of two versus ten people. Um, like, oh, okay. Which has happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not sure why it does, but, I, again, the, the gameplay is solid. The customization is pretty good, yeah. depending on what type of player you are. Like, I like playing as snipers, and while the standard sniper rifle guns are kind of iffy, the blaster pulse is just so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Battlefront's definitely on there. And I actually went ahead and got the season pass for yeah. that as well. I am that invested. I got the deluxe wow. edition of the game. That's saying something. And I got the season pass because I am that excited to see what else they bring. Yeah, and, and so far so good, I think. I think so. <laughs> so let's start from the top. Oh. Um, we kind of jumped into Battlefront there. So there's, there's Battlefront rundown. <laughs> Get that. You know, yeah. if you get around to it, um, if you like, you know, shooting bad guys or if in case you're in the stormtrooper, shooting good guys. 
then you know, go ahead and get Battlefront. That was rough, Scott. But um, so let's talk about Metal Gear Solid Five. This was a, a really uh, hot topic this year, really controversial with <laughs> all the Konami stuff and how the the, the final game came, turned out. You know, we all know at this point if you haven't played it, spoiler alert. But Statue of Limitations has been out since September, <laughs> so you know what you get into. But um, yeah, I, my 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 short version is it is. 75 to 80 percent of the greatest game I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't disagree with that. Uh, I think that this is the most accessible Metal Gear game that's come out yet. And I, yeah. I actually said that about Metal Gear Solid 4 back in the day. Mm -hmm. But with 4, you had a lot of story elements yeah. that if you didn't know, you were completely lost on. Like, who is Ava? Why is she there? It seems less so with Metal Gear Solid 5. Like, I didn't play Peace Walker at all. Yeah. And that's kind of essential to this plot. But, yeah. but they do a good job of explaining things, especially if you sit down and listen to the cassette tapes, mm -hmm. which you, know, you can do in the middle of a mission. Yeah. <laughs> which is cool. Which, which is great. Um, I, I like codec conversations. I prefer the freeform nature of the cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. Um. But again, the gameplay itself is really accessible. Controls feel good. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm going through as many menus or items. As yeah, as, everything feels very fluid. Yeah, it's it's so fun. Like it just feels good to play. Like um, there there are certain games where just just playing it just it has there's this perfect amount of feedback and responsiveness to the. The, the controls and the, the actions that you do and how they re are represented on the screen. And it feels like you're really informing the, uh, the gameplay and the environment with, with your button presses and how the world responds to you. And it just, it looks good. It, it feels good. There's so many little subtle touches and it just, they really, you know, went all out as far as graphics and just presentation and everything. It's so sad what happened and, that they they weren't able to finish the game uh, the way Kojima had probably originally intended, and it's it's clear once you get to the second chapter of the game at what point they stopped working on Metal Gear Solid Five and when they started finishing Metal Gear Solid Five, and it's it's such a shame because the first chapter of that game I'm like this is the best Metal Gear game period. Like hands down, point blank period. This is the best one I've ever played, and uh, three has held the top spot for me for years. And this felt like the the culmination of everything that Kojima has wanted to do in a Metal Gear game. This felt like every everything that he that's been done in the previous ones was informing and coming together in Metal Gear Solid Five, and to see um, the the padding. And the, the 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 abrupt the abruptness of the ending in in the game was like you know it really was was hurt and knowing being a gamer and keeping up with the news and knowing that he basically got a knife in his back probably around the turn of uh, 2014 2015 and they had to start wrapping the game up really just uh, you know makes you wonder what could have been if he had gotten more time and a little more budget to get the game where he really would have wanted it to be. Um, but in spite of that, it's still some of the most fun I've had, easily the most fun I've had this year on a game. And the I put in, I can't you know discount the fact that I put like 100 something hours into that game. And if you just go through the campaign, it won't take that long. But the, the side missions, the side ops they're called, and all that other stuff just was so engrossing and the gameplay is so like just perfectly tuned that you know it just was you know a total time suck. I took out vacation time to play this game <laughs> and I still didn't beat it when my vacation time was over. So just put that in perspective. The ending is a let is kind of a letdown, but they did they did what they could given the circumstances and it's still some of the most fun I've had. Easily the most fun I've had playing a game this year. Some of the most fun I've had in the Metal Gear series, period. Yeah, I, I still argue that the ending is Metal Gear Solid for the MSX. Oh, that's a good point. That's You were about to tell me. Yeah, okay, so um, 
this spoiler warning. Um, so you don't play as Big Boss in this one. You're actually playing as a soldier who was brainwashed into being his copy. Like, like amazing surgeons fix his face and everything. Um, so here's how all that plays out. The Venom Snake, the guy that you play as in Metal Gear Solid V, is the big boss from Outer Heaven in Metal Gear from the MSX. And he gets killed, which is why in Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake, Big Boss is back. That's the original Big Boss, yeah. who then fakes his death in Metal Gear 2. And later when they like say, like they've talked about Big Boss's body in the mm -hmm. other games, that's actually Solidus. Yeah. And that's how that all works out. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why people are so confused. It makes sense to me. I mean, it's not like it's a convoluted series of the games made over the past twenty years. It makes know. perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, I don't understand Metal Gear's story. It's confusing. I'm just looking at them like, what? Didn't you read the notes? Like, what? <laughs> didn't you play the game five times? Like, yeah. I did. What are you talking about? It's a matter of principle. You got to come in well educated. Yeah, but less so for five than all the others. Actually, yeah. And uh, with the exception of the ending, and oh yeah, Metal Gear Online. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> that was a feature that uh, wasn't at launch. They added it in and then basically said, oh, we're out. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did it. You got it. So, so enjoy. They, um, they said they'll be back next year. Well, this year now, sorry. They'll be back this year with uh, more yeah. support, content, whatnot, but we'll see. Yeah, let, yeah we'll get back. But <laughs> the game as it is, you know. So... The next item on your list uh, was actually on on my uh, backlog list for this year. Oh, okay. So tell me, tell me about the joys and wonder that is the sunshine and happiness world of Bloodborne. Bloodborne <laughs> is a great all ages E for everyone game. About I'm sorry, I can't even continue with that. So that's not true at all. It's not blood, it's blood. It's from from the, the guys who, who gave you Demon Souls and, and Dark Souls. Also family friendly. friendly. Also, family friendly <laughs> games, especially for young kids who are just getting into games and are learning, you know, mechanics and the biases of of uh, early, you know, gameplay. You know, mm -hmm. give it to them, and totally appropriate for your your favorite uh, niece or nephew. But okay, but seriously, so this is you know one of those games that is notoriously difficult, and uh, will will punish you and just you know. Kind of teaches you that death is a part of life. I'm sorry, I, I want to play this. Okay, go on. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it will it will chew you up and spit you out, but in a good way. It's it's very difficult in in a way that is immensely satisfying. Okay. So the the mechanics are tight, rock solid. You know, so it's not like you know you're you're getting cheap deaths where you don't know what happened or you know. You, you're not trying to, you're not really understanding what's going on, or the game hasn't established the rules of of what's going on. Like it, it brings you in, and it tells you up front, okay, this is how you play, and now the game is coming to get you. So, it, so it's not cheating at PlayStation. No, it's not cheating at PlayStation. <laughs> uh, you just gotta get good. You just gotta get good. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> And it's cool. so it's funny because the game literally starts out, you wake up uh, off this like hospital bed in some kind of bizarro gothic infirmary and there's a werewolf eating a dead body and you have no weapons yet. So <laughs> you die. Oh. You're, you're level one and you have no weapons. So the werewolf kills you. It's just going to happen. And then you go to this other realm. And you get your your gear and your weapons, and then you go back, and then you're like, okay, I can fight back now. So from the beginning, the game is like, you're gonna die. Hmm. Well, uh, that and sounds a lot like in Demon Souls. Yeah, you get to the end of a bridge, and there's an ogre, and you die. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a little tighter, a little faster than Demon Souls, where Demon Souls emphasizes uh, shield defense. Um, more so, uh, Bloodborne emphasizes evasion and, and rolling and diving out of the way. Um, a lot of twitchy response. So if people who, who like Devil May Cry will maybe like Bloodborne. 
uh, it's difficult in a different way, and it's a, probably even less forgiving than um, than a Devil May Cry. So where you know if you if you get hit once, there's a really good chance you're gonna get hit two or three more times. Um, so you really need to pay attention to bad guys. You need to bait out their attacks. Um, see what their attacks are before you move in for the attack for the kill, and you know you the game demands your respect. You know, so no matter how how strong you get as you level up, because a lot of games have power creep, and once you get to a certain level, you can just kind of have your way with the bad guys. But in Bloodborne, it's always about survival. No matter how much HP I got, no matter how strong I got, there's always someone around the corner waiting to mess you up. You can go back to the first level and play those bad guys. And if you get sloppy, if you relax a little too much, they can still take you down. So the game always commands your respect. So it's never boring, and the level design is, um, while incredibly labyrinthine, still you never get really lost. It's usually easy to find your way back to where you need to go, and that that's something that has been a trademark of the the better games in the series of the Dark Souls and the Demon Soul games, mm -hmm. where uh, the the series director, who's, who, the titles he's worked on have been. Uh, have said had some really good level design, and it, it will really impress you because you don't see level design like this anymore. A lot of games are getting really sandboxy, open worldy, mm -hmm. and just while they are, I'm not going to say they don't design those levels. I'm not saying that. This is this feels like it was constructed and crafted in a specific way that is more artistic and more, uh, um, I guess, auteur driven. See, I, I definitely appreciate the type of level design compared to let's just make it a sandbox game and then we'll just reuse just the same in. assets over and over. And right. Over. Or yeah. it'll be a, a randomly designed sandbox world Yeah, that's never the same way twice. And I really miss well-crafted levels that take into consideration, you know, you might be using these types of weapons, you might be mm -hmm. using these types of weapons, you might be this type of player. Yeah. Well, you might be this type of player. Now you got to think like this other type of player. So. Yeah. And it 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 was cool going in, um, not knowing what to expect, and then seeing how things fit together. Because you feel you go you get going a little bit. You know, you're about twenty minutes in, and then you hit a checkpoint, and then you're another thirty minutes in, another forty minutes in. And you're like, where's the next checkpoint? You know, where are these checkpoints? I'm. <laughs> they need to stop playing. I need to get another checkpoint. And then you come back around to your last checkpoint, and it was connected to this whole other area this whole time that was not oh at all. And now this whole area has opened up to you, and you're just like, whoa. <laughs> so all this fits together. And then as you really start to branch out, you know, it's like, okay, so this. These pieces fit together here, these pieces fit together, and then these all connect. And there are just the right amount of checkpoints for you, you know, to have a lifeline. That sounds like for you, awesome. so you don't feel like you're getting cheated. Oh. You know? Oh. So the game is still brutal, but it's like, <laughs> but we got you though. As long as you as long as you stay at it, we got you. So you're like, okay. So you're dying for the next checkpoint. So when you die <laughs> and then you're gonna die a lot. <laughs> and you're just like, ah, oh, dang it! I'm just, I gotta stop right now. As soon as you turn the game off, you're like, but what if I did stop? Oh, and then you gotta turn See, the game back on. I love games that the design is such that you play it, you love playing it, and then when you fail, you're like, oh, that's so frustrating. But I can do it. Yeah. Like that, I, I feel like that that is the type of gameplay that nearly dominated a lot of retro games yeah. and then in the more modern gaming era there's been less of that modern mm -hmm. gaming era has been very forgiving mm -hmm. and even even though you've mentioned a lot of checkpoints uh it doesn't sound forgiving at all yeah it's <laughs> it's it's fair it's not forgiving but it's fair and the game expects you the game has a certain expectation of you as a player a certain level of competency so nothing is impossible but it says you have to rise to the occasion and that is just, you know, some of, that's some of the best gameplay. Now the issue is usually not lives, but checkpoint systems. Mm -hmm. Where it is, where how far <laughs> back does the game set you? <laughs> yeah. In the fairy states. So this game, Bloodborne, balances 
uh, you know, save points and, and checkpoints, you know, pretty much perfectly. And it's, it's fun as far as uh, the challenge it expects from you. And it can get frustrating wondering how far you have to go before you find another one. But then you find one you've already had or you find a new one at just the right time and you start to see how it all fits together. Um, easily a full price $60 game. It's probably 30 bucks by now. Yeah, and, um, and then there's extra DLC for... And there, yeah, 15? there's new DLC. Yeah, the Old Hunters okay. is out now. Um, I haven't played it yet, but I'm definitely gonna. All right, that sounds great. And it's 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 worth every penny. Um, so I didn't give a dollar value. Metal Gear Solid 5, $60 game. I got 150 I was out of the game easy. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think that, again, naturally, the games that are on our best list are just full price. If you can get them at that, great. If they're on sale, even better. But, you know, yeah. like these are... By all means, get a, get a deal, but... Which... They're, they're worth asking price, <laughs> which, leads, which leads us to the next one on your list that that I actually disagree with. Oh, okay. Um, well, Batman. Uh, yeah, I I did not like Batman Arkham Knight. So didn't you like it. I didn't like it. So you, you, you explain yourself, sir. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I have my criticisms, but I like it. Um, I thought as whenever it wasn't forcing you to be Bat Tank, <laughs> it was one of the best games that came out this year. And that was one of my problems. The problem was they really oversold the whole Bat Tank thing. Um, it was fun for like maybe half as much as they make it you. And they really should have just backed off on it. Um, it could have been a, a nice new feature for for Batman to have, but they made it a core gameplay mechanic where you're just fighting drones. and You know, it was like, oh, all right, the, hey, the I get it. Race. Yeah. The Riddler races. The Riddler races? Yeah. I kind of like the Riddler races. I mean, they're completely implausible. There's no way he would be able to construct those things. But <laughs> we're accepting that a man runs around dressed as a bat. Like, storyline wise, I didn't die it. in the first 14 um, minutes on his first night out. There's just one particular turn that you have to make in one of the Riddler races mm -hmm. that is near impossible in third person mode. But if you go into first person mode, it actually changes the hitbox to the car. And there's huh. no problem with it whatsoever. That's actually really that hilarious. Uh, that's that's bad programming. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. it's hilarious and it's it, bad. Programming. It's hilarious, but also uh, not great. Um, but go ahead, go ahead. I don't know. Like I was a like I really loved Arkham Asylum. I loved yeah. the first one. Yeah, which had oddly enough uh, labyrinthine level design, mm -hmm. but it was also well constructed. And, uh, Again, tight corridors, that sort of thing. I like that. Mm -hmm. And then Arkham City came out, and it was sandbox. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that that's doesn't mean it's it's bad because I, mean, yeah. I like sandbox games, like yeah. Theft Autos and the Saints Roses. Yeah. Um, Arkham City didn't really do it for me. Hmm. And then I Arkham, and then Arkham Knight is more of that to me, mm -hmm. but with a tank. <laughs> <laughs> And then the tank was busted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, I was like, well, so uh, walking in, I was like, well, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> still Christmas? Okay. Still Christmas. Why not? Because they always take place during like Christmas, Merry Christmas or time. Or Christmas just time. Reasons. Um, well, Batman and snow go as well. Together. Yeah, they just like making it snow. I was going to say. And on the consoles, the game, visually stunning. I mean, yeah. let me, let me, before we go anywhere else. Great looking game on consoles. Yeah. So broken on the PC. Yeah, PS. This is my my PS4 uh, gaming experience here. This has nothing to do with the PC version because we know that was a complete disaster, and there is just no excuse for any of what what happened. So if you have the console version, you're in, you're in good shape. I, I think it's a polite PC way of players. It, I'm sorry. The polite way of putting it would be a clusterfuck. Yes. Um, it, putting it charitably. <laughs> it, and on the PS4, I mean, I ran some glitches as well, but yeah. nothing nothing where it would bother me. Nothing like, I want my money back. Yeah, I had nothing that made me want my money back. I was just like, mm, Right. You he's, know, that happens. He's fit, means. But I'm, I'm glad that you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I am about a lot of games. Like, I'm glad you like that. 
I played it. I was satisfied by the time I got to the end of it. I was like, there's no way I'm going to get all this really trophy so I can get the good ending. I'm not going to do that. I have I have real things to do. There's YouTube. Uh, yeah. Which is what I'm I just going to watch. You'll YouTube. find the, uh, <laughs> the Let's Play YouTube ending. So. Yeah. Not, not disappointing. It. it wasn't disappointing me. I was just like, all right, for Batman. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Oh, Batman. So. <laughs> Um, and and uh, I was just I do want to point out that this doesn't speak so much to the top tier quality of this game as it does to the lack of competition in 2015's uh, game releases. So <laughs> it's a little from column A, a little from column B. This was a solid game on console, but there wasn't a whole lot out there for it to go up against. So as far as what I played, you know, this was one of my more satisfying. Um, better experiences. If Uncharted 4 had made it out this year, then that'd probably <laughs> be a different story, but here we go. Yeah. And the next item on your list, you also gotta defend a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. Only a little. DMC Devil May Cry yeah. Definitive Edition, the remake of DMC, which came out a year and a half, two years, two years, two years ago at this point. Yeah. Um, so, why should people buy it again <laughs> if they haven't bought it already? If you have, if you haven't bought it already, but if you did play the the 2013 version, this is like if you're really into action slash Devil May Cry games, then you should get it. Um, if you if you liked the the 2013 version, because I know a lot of people that just straight up liked it, no complaints whatsoever, and I know a lot of the fan base just reacted horribly. <laughs> Against all the changes they made, it, just, it was a you know this game. I think it moved like a hundred thousand copies or something in its yeah. first week or first month. It was terrible. Yeah. And um, but I I felt like I got it. I was on the fence until up until it came out, and I decided to go and get it. It was forty bucks. I was like, okay, forty dollars HD. I got rid of my old version already. I'll get it. Um, and all the DLC and unlockables in the game are available as soon as you pop the game in. They've uh, used the, the, the PlayStation 4's headroom, or three, uh, Xbox One, it's on there too, um, to bring the gameplay up to the standard that we expected in the first place. So while Ninja Theory was pushing visual fidelity um, with the Unreal Engine, because reasons. Um, that's I guess those are the tools they're familiar with. Um, we didn't get our 60 frames per second. We didn't get, um, you know, certain, you know, touches that you expect out of Devil May Cry difficulty, um, that kind of thing. That was all here. So you could, and you could customize. This was really different and what really impressed me about the, the HD uh, Definitive Edition, I guess, is you could customize your experience based on your preferences. So I could turn on, um, I could make it hard combo uh, scoring harder because a lot of people were saying it's too easy to get S rank combos. So you can make the combo scoring more uh, difficult. You can, um, it's in 60 frames per second. You can put turbo mode on so the game is even faster. Like it's even more oh frenetic. So, uh, when you're fighting bad guys, Dante and the enemies, just aside from the frame rate being smooth, they move quicker, the action is more fast paced. So I had turbo mode on. I didn't put the hard combo mode on because I like getting those S ranks. I, just, <laughs> I, like, I like ranking up those S rank combos. Gotta yeah. feel good about that. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you feel good. <laughs> but uh, it's in 1080p, so it looks better than ever. Um, and you could customize, add all the unlockable content from as soon as you turn the game on. So, you could make Dante look like Dante from the start of the game. So, in certain cutscenes where it's not just running off of the, the game engine where it's like pre recorded, you know, and then it goes back to ugly black, black haired Dante. But for everything else, you know, he looks like however you dress him up. So, for me, doing that is like, wow, this is the game they should have released two years ago. This is great. <laughs> so, that basically made it the Devil May Cry reboot we should have gotten. Um, and it's like, well, man, if they jumped off from here and just did what the fans wanted, then this would this would be great. They'd be golden. So it was cool. I felt like this is the game, Devil May Cry, we deserved in 2013. And 
you know, it performs the way it should. It is customizable to get it how you want it and how most of the fans would have wanted it. So even if you weren't necessarily a fan of the 2013 release, you might actually like uh, Definitive Edition. And anybody who either passed on the 2013 release or uh, was a little let down by it might want to give this a try, especially the asking price when it came out was $40, so it's probably $30, $20 by now if you can find it on Amazon or, you know, some for Markdown. And, you know, I think Capcom is, is testing the waters to see how they should move forward with the series because they released, not long after the Definitive Edition came out, they put out Devil May Cry 4, uh, Definitive HD, Edition. Definitive yeah. Edition, whatever you want to call it. So I think based on, you know, the response they get from those, and that was digital only, actually. Yeah. I think based on that response, they're going to just determine how they want to move forward with that game. But uh, I, I stand by that game. I still, I kept it. I didn't trade it in like I did, you know, <laughs> the 2013 release. I was like, oh, I beat it. I don't think I'm ever going to play it again. And then <laughs> took it back. But I feel like that's a game I can come back to and enjoy. Nice. Um, Rocket League. This was a surprise uh, PS Plus game that came out of nowhere. Came out of... Absolutely no way. Absolutely no way. And it's so fun. It's too fun. <laughs> too fun. You know, I need to get more controllers now. Like, that's how fun it is, because I have, I have two controllers, yep. and I want to be able to have four-player parties, you know, when friends are over and just go crazy. And you can play with bots or play online or play couch co-op or couch uh, competitive mode, and it's just so fun. And... It, you, you play uh, a car, you're like art, controlling RC cars, or what look like RC cars, or they might be regular, just souped up cars in a, uh, a giant <laughs> soccer field. I don't know how, how it works. And they're hitting a, a soccer ball into each other's gold, which explode, by the way, when you score a goal. Yes. So that's cool. Explode so, gloriously. Explosions are always a plus. And... It's just, it's absurdly simple and absurdly fun. You know, you're like, hey, what if soccer had cars in it? And then they just did that. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, actually, like, I had an RC car. A buddy of mine had an RC car. We had a soccer ball. Mm -hmm. And, like, we would just draw out, like, a soccer field in a parking lot and play with that. That's and actually that was really fun. cool. And I was like, that was super fun. And it's like, oh, they made a game like that. <laughs> and... It, it's so simple, like you said, it controls so well. The yeah. controls are fantastically tight. Yeah, controls are tight, graphics yeah. are sharp. It's not as it's not as clunky as controlling an RC car. It, it's, yeah, it, thank it's, God. It's glorious. You can run up the walls. Yeah, you can the, do the rings, the, the stadium uh, soccer fields have walls and ceilings. And yep. You can drive up and down them. And you can do flips and tricks. There are ways to hit the ball around. You, you can slide into it. You can steal. It's, again... It's soccer with cars, and it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's super fun. It came out at twenty dollars. It was on PS Plus when it first came out for free, um, but it's totally worth twenty dollars. If I didn't have Plus, I totally would have paid twenty dollars for this game. Same here. <laughs> um, I recommend it to everybody. Um, it might be cheaper than that now because it's been you know maybe six seven months since it came out. Um, just get it. It's too much fun. Just just get Rocket League if you haven't already. And the last game uh, on my best of list is Oddworld New and Tasty. That was a lot of fun. I never, I could never beat the original Oddworld. Really? Um, yeah. Either because of time or just I wasn't, I didn't have the dexterity, you know. I, I had to use a lot of game facts on that one when I was there. Yeah. <laughs> and... They, they took Oddworld from the original PS1, Abe's Odyssey, and made it completely, you know, next-gen. Uh, it's got 3D graphics. It's still left to right, right to left, side-scrolling, but the graphics are nice. Um, 1080p. Um, the cutscenes are all done in the in-game graphics because they're, they're up to that level at this point. And the screen wipes that used to be in the PS1 version because you only had so much memory, so when you got to the end of the screen, it had to, you know, do a screen wipe to the next screen mm -hmm. transition. Now, every every level is one level that's cohesive and continuous. Wow. So, 
when you don't know what's on the next side of the level, <laughs> you have a, a much better uh, chance of survival if something uh, surprises you. So it's really like uh, in the in the old original version, you know, you get to the end of the screen, there'd be a screen wipe, and then a, a guard is gonna shoot you or something, and he's like, "Hey," and you're dead, and <laughs> Yeah, you got to go back to the beginning, but in this, as the, since the level is one continuous level because they have the you know the memory now to just have the whole thing going, um, you can really adapt and think on the fly and respond to the gameplay uh, in a seamless way because the whole level is there and is reactive and doesn't there's no breaks in the design and that made a world of difference in, in how I played the game. Um, it just, it's just, it was a classic when it came out. It always, it's still a classic, you know, so them just bringing it up to the next gen standard was just, you know, icing on the cake. It's, it's a great game. I don't remember what the starting price on it was. Uh, the starting price was fourteen ninety nine, 99 and there's a steel or 50 cents DLC pack for it. Yeah. And yeah. 15 bucks. You can't beat that. This is a great game. If you got it when it was on PS Plus, like I did, uh, by all means, play it now. It's in my backlog as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's the problem. It's like you get these free games each month if you're a plus subscriber. And <laughs> so you just download it because you might, you're going to get to it later. But mm -hmm. later it never comes. You know, it's just like, it happens. Ah. so you have this backlog of games that you <laughs> pay, kind of pay for. And they're just, you know, oh, yeah, you yeah. got a great deal on you them. You paid fifty dollars a year, yeah, <laughs> so. for your plus subscription, and then they're just kind of like waiting, like, yo, Peter, what, what, what's going on? You got, what's going on? You gonna play us? I mean, I, I mean, you're on the hard drive. I just, I got, I got school. You used to play me on the hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> God so, damn it! I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, don't, not even, <laughs> bastard. Uh, hey. All right, I apologize for that. Oh, God, you so so that's that's my best of 2015 for me. Um, Pete's gonna run yeah. down his too. We already went over. Yeah, we went over Metal two Gear, of them, really. We yeah, went over Battlefront yeah. and Battlefront. Yeah. So uh, again, Metal Gear Solid Five, most accessible, fantastic, limp ending, but. Uh, yeah, just play the next one in the line. You're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, just just immediately. Pop in another Metal Gear. Yeah, exactly. It, it it's all it's got a chronology. It's it's fine. Um, so one of the things that I did want to mention about Battlefront is that I do not play Battlefront in long spurts. No, I only play it in short spurts. It definitely which feels like it's perfect for. It. Yeah, it's like, like I'm gonna good. play a round or two. Depending on what mode you play, that can last anywhere from five minutes to like half an hour. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? That, that's good. I can go out on top. Yeah. And I feel good about that. Yeah, that's that's and, what it's really great for. It's really about is pick up and put down gameplay. And it, it does have a series of unlocks for customization, like character customization of weapons, that you have to reach a certain level and then you have to have the credits to to actually buy it. Which, you know, I'm right now I'm level forty six. Four away from that Shadow Trooper uniform. I want it. I want it so bad. Um, but they've had double EXP weekends. Yeah. Uh, they had one for Christmas. They had one for when Force Awakens came out. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, when Force Awakens comes out on DVD, they'll have They're another gonna have one. They're going to have some. And May the 4th is probably, probably also going to be a double EXP day. They were giving out not just XP, but currency. Well, that's the uh, Your EXP translates into currency. Oh, just divided okay. by a thousand. I see. So if you get a thousand XP in a match, then you get a hundred credits. I got you. So you really have to play pretty well to get like those higher numbers. Right. And then on double XP, it's multiplied by two. So yeah, definitely cool. worthwhile playing. So the next game I want to talk about is Tales from the Borderlands, hmm. which, oh my god, we got a Kevin S game of the year. Surprise hit. Uh, I'm not going to say surprise hit, simply because Telltale Games has kind of made themselves the quality storytellers of the video game world. Yeah. And 
Tales from the Borderlands is their best story yet. Wow. Uh, you know, a lot of good stories have, you know, you got your, your rising action, you plateau, you have another rising action, you know, you dip down, and then you amp up for your conclusion. Mm -hmm. Now imagine playing an episode, because it was released episodically at first. I played it when it fully came out. Each episode has that series of events. And then when you pan out and look at the story as a whole, it also follows that same pattern. There's never a, a, a truly dull moment in the series, and it's wonderful. Wow. It, it is compelling. The characters come across as truly human, even the robots. <laughs> wow. Which is interesting because, you know, beforehand in Borderlands, with the exception of Claptrap, there really isn't much to the AI characters. Yeah. They're just AIs. Yeah. Well, this one shows that AIs actually can develop and have emotions and feelings of wow. them, and you care about them. That's cool. There's several moments where I'm like, oh, my hurt. <laughs> no. Uh, the voice acting was amazing. Troy Baker, the man who's mm -hmm. in everything that Nolan North isn't. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because Nolan North is in this one as well. <laughs> so stay in employed, um, baby. Stay in employed. They're both fantastic. Um, the woman who played uh, the young girl from The Walking Dead also plays a character in this one. And again, she steals the show. Mm. She doesn't show up until like episode three and she steals the show. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but again, five episodes. It's a complete story. It, again, Telltale gameplay is pretty, t pretty typical. Uh, kind of point and click with some quick time events thrown in there. This one has a lot of great Borderlands style to it, because again, it, it it uses the Telltale engine, but it has all of the visual effects that you would expect from a Borderlands game. Hmm. And it, it even pulls models from Borderlands to put in, like Claptraps I mean, in there, That's cool. loader bots from the pre-sequel, and Borderlands 2 are in there as well. Uh, as are certain certain Borderlands characters that you may or may not have played as. Um, I don't want to spoil the story at all. It's so good. Nice. Again, it is. I I paid full price for it. Game of the year. Ten out of ten. A plus. Go play it. Would do it. Would play again. I would. Yeah. Uh, simply because I didn't. I actually played through. I didn't unlock everything that I could yeah. see. Because wow. there's so many choices that you can make that actually genuinely affect game. Wow, that's cool. And the the amazing thing is, it actually does feel like it's the segue into Borderlands 3. Like, if you don't play this game, you might not understand some of the things that are happening in Borderlands 3. Hmm. So, if you're a fan of the series, which I am, yeah. uh, that's absolutely there's, there's incentive there. You know. And, of course, another amazing performance by the guy who plays as Handsome Jack. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he he's back too, but that's all I'm saying. Cool. Um, what's the next game? I, I've got the next two titles are for Nintendo. Hey Nintendo, what's that? On the we Wii, see you. U. <laughs> which, Wii U. Which you know, a lot of people sat here and were like, the Wii U's release this year was was bad. Yeah, yeah the Star Fox was delayed. And, uh, Devil's Third turned out to be bad. And, it's bad, but in an amazing sort of way. <laughs> um, uh, so first up, Super Mario Maker is brilliant. Yeah, it, that's, that's what I'm, I'm getting from that game. So a lot of people joke around, and they're like, well, Nintendo's just like, uh, we're tired of making Mario games, making it myself. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Which, I mean, if Nintendo was lazy about it, that's exactly what they could have done. They could have yeah. been like, here's our assets for Mario 1, Mario 3, Super Mario World, and New Super Mario Brothers, Wii U. Yeah. And be like, there. Yeah, go, go have fun. Do what you will. We don't care. Um, but they do. What's amazing is the fact that the game has been updated multiple times. One, to, oh, patch, okay. out, to patch out glitches. Because yeah. one of the things is to upload a level online, you have to be able to beat your own level. Ooh. Ooh, exactly. Very smart. Which is very smart. Utterly brilliant on Nintendo's part. And you also have to be able to beat it if you 
from any checkpoints if you have checkpoints in your level, which they added post post gameplay when people were like, we really miss checkpoints. Yeah, and they were like, okay, checkpoints here. That's great. That well, the first thing was support and response to the community. It was another thing that people wanted was P switch doors, where you had a P switch and an invisible door would right. pop up. They're like, well, we're not going to make the doors completely invisible. We're just going to have an outline for them. But here they are. Yeah. They're in the game now. From a design <laughs> standpoint, they have to, you know, like, okay, it's they like, have reasons for this. Yeah, it's like, we, you know, even in the older games, we had clues, like we had coins around where a piece yeah. of door would be. Like, and people might not necessarily put down coins, so where would they know where the door is? Exactly. So they're like, we had to do something so that people aren't completely insidious. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, they they actually do a great job of flagging levels that mm -hmm. have content that aren't for kids. Right. So you can't just make a level that's a dick <laughs> and expect it to last online See, very that's, long. That's people, you know, you talk a lot of smack about Nintendo, but you guys give them credit when, uh, when they do online, they are engaged mm -hmm. and they, they do seem to really care about balance and uh, fostering a positive online environment. Yeah. Uh, one of the crazy things is people were like, it's really hard to find specific types of levels. Mm -hmm. um, so like, okay, we're going to make a level search engine that's on a browser so that you can either access the browser on the Wii U gamepad while you're playing the game, Dope. or uh, you can go on your computer right now and just, there it is. And yeah. You can find stuff to play later. That's brilliant. That is maintaining... And the thing is, the gameplay itself is solid. It's Mario Games. Yeah. Yeah, it's really hard to screw up Super Mario it's Brothers when you're Nintendo. Right, <laughs> um, fundamentals. And of course, you know, each version has, you know, it builds up on all the others. Yeah. Mario 1 is very basic. Mario 3 adds being able to pick up shells and flight. Super Mario nice. World adds the spin jump to it and being able to kick things directly up. Right, so... And then we, the Wii version is a culmination of all that. Nice. So the you pick which... Um, gameplay mechanics mm -hmm. you're, you're going to use depending on what type of Mario game you're in. Exactly. And the nice thing is it's shipped with hundreds of levels made by Nintendo themselves. Yeah. So it's like, well, if you don't have an online connection, that's still okay. <laughs> you you still, can still have a, something to still play. a ton of game here. So they did a fantastic job, and I, I cannot praise them enough. Which is, leads directly into Splatoon. Yeah, because Splatoon, that was a surprise hit. Splatoon is one best shooter of the year at the VGAs, <laughs> <laughs> and like it's amazing. You see, Dark Grim Shooter Game One, Dark Grim Shooter Game Two, Splatoon, Dark Grim Shooter Game Three, and then Splatoon wins. Yeah, which I think says a lot about the game itself. Yeah, um, it just the basic mechanics. I got the game at launch, mm -hmm. and I was like. The core mechanics behind the game are fun, which is you shoot ink, and whoever, at the time, the main gameplay mode was whoever has the most ink on the ground wins. Mm. And you can swim through your own colored ink to recharge. If you get hit by enemy ink, you lose health, which you can regenerate by going back That's into your own ink. ink. Yeah. Um, or if you're just walking through their ink, you go very, very slowly and are vulnerable. Yeah. And you can't just swim through, you actually have to go back into kid mode. Yeah, that's so much better and more interesting than just shoot guy, guy fall down, you know? Like, which, which is funny because that's what Battlefront is. Right. Um, but... Like, being what it is, it's cool, but, but for... Exactly. You know, game of the year material, you know... You, you, you have to step it up, and Splatoon... First of all, the level designs are interesting. There's yeah. a lot of verticality to levels, which is fantastic on Nintendo's part. They've always done platforming very well, mm -hmm. and they've incorporated platforming extremely well into Splatoon's shooting mechanics, where depending on what type of player you are, you can get up front and personal with somebody, like if you have a paint roller, or you can find a very high point and snipe people using their equivalent of a sniper gun, yeah. which Again, these are basic gameplay mechanics that you would expect from those types of shooters, but it's so well done. Yeah. Nintendo did such a great job, and it's so much fun. There's a lot of charm to the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they designed it based on 
kids who hang out in Akihabara listening to rap. <laughs> that was their design mechanic for the game, and it shows your main hub is next to a mall. Yeah. Where you go shopping for the different clothing items, which you level up by playing, yeah. and those unlock new abilities. Yeah, that's neat. And you can like get like your ink recharge factor. Maybe you take fewer hits. Maybe your special items recharge faster. Like, depending on what equipment you have, then that's wonderful because yeah. you don't know what the equipment's going to get you every time. Right. Because it's ran like certain amount of it, it's random. So it's cool. It's like, all right, this is a great piece of uniform. Doesn't have all the stat boosters I need, so I need to go out and get another one. Because yeah. I need to play more online and get more points and get better. Yeah. So the, and, the mechanics, uh, or I should say the the accessories and the items inform the mechanics, inform the items, inform the mechanics. Like that's mm -hmm. each one is codependent and or interdependent, I should say, and really keeps you playing. Exactly. And then to make it even better, for the past six months, up and in, including like this week, uh, as of the first week of January, Nintendo gave out free updates. We went from six maps to now we've got like two dozen wow. different maps now. We went from about 30 weapons, now they're 75. Man, that's awesome. That is fantastic. And they're like, it's free. Here you still, go. Just update your game. Play the game. You and then, this game. So they're they're not going to be doing as many major updates like that anymore. But they said that the weekend splat fests, yeah. where you choose a team, yeah. where they're like cats versus dogs or something like that, something silly, and you just play. Yeah. <laughs> and based on whether you win or lose, you add points to your column and your team. Yeah, that's some serious groundwork as far as just online support. That's like really putting in the goodwill towards, mm -hmm. towards the user base. So Splatoon is just a fantastic game that they did such a great job with. Yeah. Uh, I again. Excellent. I think the game both both sets of games from our list again full price. If <laughs> yeah. if if you can get them on sale, fantastic. But if you had to pay full price, you're not gonna be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. Not even a little bit. Which is funny because now uh, we're we're going into our disappointments of 2015. The disappointing. Which, which I think that you know for the most part it was a pretty good year. But yeah. there, there were problems. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to spend too long on most of these, but uh, we're, we're just going to run, run this down real quick. Mm -hmm. um, the Order 1886. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't bother with this one. Even when I saw it for 20 bucks, I was like, yeah. you uh, know what? I don't need that in my life. No, I didn't, I didn't buy this, but I played it. And oh. it's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> and that's it. So yeah, don't don't buy don't buy this game. Maybe Sony, you know, you guys can make a, a proper game next time that you've got the graphics in place, you've got the art and the vision, I guess, for what you want to do with this. The idea looked sweet. I was really looking forward to this game before it came out. And it's a huge letdown. It's like you can beat it in one sitting and it's not even that fun in the first place. Uh, so I think one of the most disappointing things is the fact that it's Ready at Dawn, who yeah. made a lot of da Daxter on the PSP. Yeah. Both God of War games on the PSP, one of which I think is has one of the most emotional scenes in all of gaming. Yeah. Um, they did Okami on the Wii, yeah. which was an amazing port job that they then based the PlayStation 3 version off of. And then they released the Order 18 scene. What are you doing? <laughs> I don't. We, you guys got Sony money. <laughs> yeah, y'all got Sony money and Sony support. I got no excuses, man. Yeah, they right. should have, you know, spent a little more time, less on cutscenes and making it look like a movie, and more on uh, making a tight game because they've done it before. They made good games. These guys have a pedigree. We we've talked more about their incapability of making gameplay than they spent on gameplay. Pretty much. <laughs> We just we just lapsed. <laughs> the, the gameplay in that game was just talking about it. Yep. So moving on, uh, The Witcher Three. <gasps> that is, I, I I was shocked when you listed this. So please go on. Yeah. So I'm not saying this is by any any means. Full disclaimer. This is I'm not saying by any means this is a bad game. What I am saying is for me, this was a disappointing game. Um, 
it's it's gorgeous looks great on whatever system you get um, um, CD Projekt Red those guys put a lot of passion and, and time and quality in their games they give you they gave you the soundtrack and some decals in the box you just the standard edition uh, game box comes with from some free extra stuff in it I'm like wow cool guys thanks mm -hmm. and you can tell as soon as you pop the game in and it installs and gets started that okay th this is a, a very lovingly constructed world that they've that they've set up for you and there, it has so much going for it but I think the problem was it was just wasn't my type of game um, I got to uh, I felt like the the side quests were just too much I felt and I'm at this point you know in my life where you know I'm I'm thirty I just turned thirty and I'm like I don't have time <laughs> for games that aren't um, just completely amazing and I don't have time to be confused and lost in a game for more than in, like a day mm -hmm. and I felt like the the side quest just kind of just metastasized too long like they just went went on and like it was like you complete the first objective in a side quest and then it turns into two more objectives and another one. And I'm like, man, I just want to be done with this. I'm trying to get on with life. And I felt like maybe there was too much game for me, you know, and a lot of times objectives weren't clear. Like it would tell you what to do, but it wouldn't tell you where to do it or where to go. If you're not sure how you feel about those kinds of games, if you haven't played a Witcher game, you don't know how, if you like it. Um, Maybe try to get it at half price or forty bucks, so you don't get too burned if it's not for you, not working for you. I think you're going to see some similar complaints in terms of that type of gameplay from a game that's on my list. Yeah, and I feel like it's it's not usual for me to jump into games that I don't get into. I usually, I try to uh, appreciate a large variety of games, so it's it's rare for me that I get a game that is not quite clicking or or do it, you know, hitting in the right, you know, buttons, buttons for me, but, you know, every once in a while you, you get one, you know, even if it's really, a really great game, game of the year material. Uh, speaking of not quite uh, clicking buttons and not quite hitting things right, what what's Konami doing lately? Um, I don't know. Nobody knows. That's not true. We the do know. Pachinko. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pull the lever. Hit the lever. <laughs> Pull get the, the lever, lever, get the button, get the balls. Uh -huh. The more balls you have, the more you can trade in for yen. Hit the lever. Hit the lever. Well, what was what was the phrase from the Silent Hill Pachinko? Um, erotic horror action, something like that? Was it really? I purged it. I watched it. Um, so you have some grievances with Konami. Yeah, year. that that was that, that's my other disappointment. One of my other disappointments for 2015 is Konami, uh, the entire company. Uh, hashtag fuck Konami. <laughs> hashtag fuck Konami. Um, they just I don't know. They just ran their game division straight into the ground. I don't know what they're thinking. You know, they spent the last year completely destroying any credibility and goodwill they had left in the gaming community, abusing the hell out of their teams. Uh, most notably, you know, killing their golden goose, Hideo Kojima, shout out to Kojima. Uh, thankfully, he's landed on his feet and has moved on to better things and has a, a relationship with Sony where they respect him and the people he works with and he has an environment where uh, he can create and just uh, move on to the next thing and, you know, they just... I don't know what what is going on over there, and they he's contractually, uh, basically, contractually obligated not to speak on it, so he can't just you know yeah, tell us even... what's going on or what happened. Um, my guess is there was some kind of power struggle because he spent the last five six years like just burning through cash mm -hmm. uh, to get Metal Gear Solid Five made, and uh, you know Kojima has enough faith in his products and his fan base that he knows that they're going to get the return on their investment but you know he's 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 he still has to answer to or still had to answer to a board and uh the president and ceo 
of Konami and I guess they just weren't having it and they have a whole other direction that they're trying to go in. I don't know what that is aside from into the ground, but all, all I'm going to say is, you know, a lot of market analysts that look at the art in Japan, that look at arcades in Japan, have pointed out that there's probably going to be a bubble burst on pachinko machines very, very soon. Yeah. And yet Konami seems to be going all oh, in. in. On these things, Whole hog on which games. you know Japan cares about. I don't know anybody in America who's ever said, "Let's go play pachinko." No, nobody. No, that's um, not a global market. And this is even sadder for those of us who like retro games. Yeah, you know your Castlevanias, your Contras. You're not going to see those again, not yeah. for a while. And it's even more crucial because a couple of years ago, they bought Hudson Soft. Yeah. So games like Bomberman so anyway. and Bonx Adventure... Well, what's going to happen? They're just going to sit on those licenses. The, the, nothing has happened with Bomberman, which is weird because he was so prevalent yeah. for the past 20 years. He had multiple games on every system. If it had a screen, there was a Bomberman game on it. Even Bomberman mm -hmm. Act Zero. Yeah. But... The less said, the better. We can't yeah. blame Konami for that one. <laughs> yeah, but, but it, it, it's baffling what their current market strategy is, if they have one. Yeah, if uh, they can just shed some light on what their plans are. So, just not even to make us feel better, but just try to make sense of all this, because nothing that they've done in the last year makes any sense to anybody. I remember a couple of years ago when Capcom decided to cancel a bunch of Mega Man games. Yeah. And then everyone was like, Capcom's going down. Nobody knows. But Capcom's still doing things. They're still studying. They're still making money. Yeah. What Konami's been doing has been leagues worse than what Capcom yeah. has this done is at any point. Way beyond the pale. This is nothing. Even Capcom was sitting back like, dude, oh, why, would, why would you do that? And it's weird because... Japanese uh, console development and the creators behind those classic games we love, they've just been shoving those guys out the door over the last decade or so. Um, and Kojima was like the last one. He was like, you know, the last unicorn. He was also their vice president at one point. Yes, so. he was their vice president. <laughs> right so, until they threw him out. Again, hashtag fucking army. You, you, you were also disappointed with with Sony a little bit this year. Yeah, uh, not a whole lot of first party action this year. They came out of the gate with a couple games that were, you know, hit or miss. Bloodborne, dope. The Order 1886, nope. Um, and then the second half of the year was just kind of like, mm, we'll let the third parties handle it. And I don't think any of those games were exclusives. So it was just kind of like, you know, we're just going to ride our momentum off of our launch success and our sales numbers. And let our games that aren't quite ready yet, we're just going to let them cook a little bit longer. We're going to push, hold off on Uncharted. We're going to, you know. So some of these games, you know, understandably, they're not ready yet. But my question is, okay, so how how is how are things prioritized as far as the 2015 release calendar? Because they didn't really have anything going on this, you know, second half of the year. And, you know, a lot of these games, we just have to wait you know, the next couple months for, to get them. But, you know, at least, you know, Star Wars Battlefront, you know, keep me busy for a little bit. Not exclusive, but it'll keep you busy. Not exclusive. Again, you know. Well, I, guess, solid five. I guess they just made <laughs> some calculated executive decisions because, you know, they're like, hey, we're out selling Xbox almost two to one. We don't really need to be present this holiday season. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of... We're going to put some good stuff on PS Plus and we'll let you decide. And we'll let you handle it. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, even thinking about next year, there's Uncharted 4 in April. Yeah. We got Horizon. Okay. And then Street got, Fighter 5 is making sure it's on PC and PS4. But, yeah. yeah. But they're not, they're not, they're not at war with PC. <laughs> yeah. They're just kind of like, yeah, PC's cool. <laughs> PC can do this too, but y'all can know, do whatever y'all want. <laughs> if it's third party, they can have a PC game, but PC yeah, version. Make your money. Uh, what about that uh, that world game that uh, they've been teasing for like two years now? 
Um, what was it? I don't know. What does it look like? Uh, it's the one where you go visit and explore different worlds, and you can. Oh, um, No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky. So 2016. I think, I think June. <laughs> June. I think. Don't quote me on that. I'm, that's off the top of my head. Don't quote me on that. We'll uh, we'll put a little YouTube. Well, oh, asterisk <laughs> June or question mark June 2016. Because uh, I mean, they got they got some solid stuff coming out. Yeah. Uh, just. For first party titles, this was not their year. No. And I think they, you know, made a calculated risk or decision. We're like, yeah, we're okay with that. Looking at the current sales numbers and what they got going on, they're like, yeah, we're fine. We'll just ride into 2016 and then come out, you know, swinging. But hey. Based on the games we got, I don't think that's a problem. Right. <laughs> so, and then my last disappointment, and Pete's going to just jump in behind me on this because we both are feeling this right now, was Mighty Number no. 9. My number nine, where are you at, though? What, what, what was the last thing we heard about this game, Pete? So, okay, so it was announced 2013. They said development was going to take like a year and a half, so they said maybe end of 2014, early 2015. So, of course, people were like, 2014? Yes. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen. Um, then they said June. June, June of, of 2015. Year. And then they said July of 2015. And they actually had pre-orders for signature editions of the game, which included, like, the first batch of DLC. They got canceled. <laughs> okay. Uh, like, retailers canceled Concept. those pre-orders. And then they were like, okay. Because Comset actually teamed up with Deep Silver mm-hmm. to actually get the physical game out, which I think was a good idea on both companies' parts. Yeah. Until, so that, that happened, and then in August, they came out and said, so the game... Isn't gonna be ready until February of 2016, and they finally pinned February 9th. And I, I kickstarted this. Yeah, like I remember 2013, 2012. I kickstarted this in 2013, and, and I'm like, well, I really hope that that PS4 version, since it's gonna be crossplay, you get the PS3 and Vita version as well. Really hope that, that PS4 version is solid. Yeah. And I also, you know, I hope that every version is solid because it sounds like the v, the the Vita and the 3DS have had a lot of difficulties in mm. terms of development. Uh-oh. And they also said that the main reason they delayed it that long was because there were bugs with the online components. And I was like, isn't there only a leaderboard? And oh, you're going to turn the two player mode online? Oh. Oh dear! Seeing how this is a game that originally went from you could copy any enemy's abilities to uh, you, you can only copy the boss's abilities very quickly, and then more and more things seem like they're being taken away. It's like, uh, come on, guys! I really hope you guys get together. Just get it done, guys. You know this is a Kickstarter project. You can't just fold on this. Like you have to get it out. Yeah, do do not fold. All right, <laughs> all right. So, so we, we both. You know, wait, like, where's where's my number nine? Wait, what else you got? I got... I'm going to be crucified for this. Do it. Fallout 4. I don't care for Fallout 4. And I paid for the Pip-Boy edition. <laughs> so it gouges that much deeper. Um, <sighs> like, is it buggy? And yeah, I took yeah. that. I mean, I as, exploited, as much as I I exploited that. Game. I got a cryo gun from a dog. <laughs> 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 Is it grim? I mean, yeah. I mean, the first moment of the game, you wake up in a cryo chamber, and your your spouse is killed and your yeah. baby stolen. Like, oh, okay, this is grim. And even visually, there's a grim. really messed up fridge in your uh, there. Mm. <laughs> that mm. oh, I'm just, sorry. I just realized that too. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. But honestly, there's like one word to describe the game, and it's drab. Yeah. The whole game is very drab. I mean, visually and as a gameplay experience. Um, I went in with an extremely open mind. Because, I mean, I played Fallout 3. I knew what to expect there. I played New Vegas. I actually had a lot of fun with New Vegas. That's what I hear. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, this, for some reason, plays like a blending of the two, but mm-hmm. not in all the best ways. Right. Um, kind of a smash I, and grab. Kind of a smash and grab. And I was left really unimpressed by any particular component of the game. Um, the dialogue is very, very stilted, whether it's coming from the player character or from an NPC. Yeah. It's just 
very I'm still pretty early in it. Very but, robotic. Um, but I definitely get that. I agree. Um, the menus are exceptionally clunky, and yes. you have a million of them in the game. Yeah, not but okay. I, Just the pit boy navigation. Is pit boy like, navigation is a pain in the butt. I'm sorry, but the, all four triggers and the face buttons do something on a pit boy navigation screen. Yeah, it's I, not fun. It, it's extremely counterintuitive. I, I went from Metal Gear Solid Five to Fallout Four in terms of menu navigation. I was like, <laughs> "You guys clearly um, have not thought about this. You have not." Um, and I mean, it, it, it honestly it feels like a game that probably would have come out in the last generation. Yeah, it doesn't feel like an Xbox One or PS4 game. Yeah, it I will feels see. like a last gen game that may have been upraised. I know. I, I, I want to say I'm not going to say it looks like a PS3 game because it, it doesn't. There's a, there's a but lot. But it doesn't. In the game. It doesn't look like a PS4 game. Yeah, I'll and say that. The thing is, it it lacks polish. Yeah, the whole experience lacks polish, and this is a AAA game. Yeah, I wonder what what decisions were made or what factors were involved in deciding to release it this year because they announced it. And it was out a couple months later. Oh, yeah. They were like, oh, snap, we're getting Fallout 4 this year. What? Just made the announcement. And then it's just kind of, mm, all right. And what, what leads me to believe that it may have been a last gen game that was converted, simply because this game has been in development since Fallout 3 was done. Yeah, and that was that not was, even, that was even tail end of last gen. That was halfway it, through. Exactly. That was 2007, like, 2008. That may be 2009. Okay. But still... That's like six years they've been working on this. And I'm like, there's no way in heck they didn't at least start on PS3, Xbox, Xbox 360 architecture. Yeah. So going from a game that I think could be uh, an upscale to one that definitely is an upscale PlayStation 3 game. <laughs> um, J-Star's Victory Versus Plus. Mm. Okay, I really, really wanted to like this game. Me too. In, in the long run. Because in the short term, I was like, hey, this is good. Because um, what if you play a game with Luffy, Goku, and Tariko, where you fight characters like Roni Kenshin, Koro Sensei from Assassination Classroom. Watch that. Assassinate. Kenshiro. <laughs> and RLA from freaking uh, Dr. Slump. Right. Come like, th doesn't that sound like a she fights with poo on a stick? How oh, can you man. hate that? That's messed up. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's messed up and a powerful attack. How can you... That sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, heck, everybody remembers playing J um, Jump Stars on the DS and loving that. This sounds so good on paper yeah. where it's originally printed. <laughs> and yet... It, Actually playing the game, it's really disappointing. Yeah. It's a 2v2 fight. 2v2 simultaneous. Mm -hmm. You choose two characters, and then the other person or the computer chooses two characters. You can't switch off between your characters. You only play as whichever one you select before the battle. Which I thought was kind of weird, but I was like, okay, the computer's capable enough to handle itself. Mm -hmm. I'm not constantly rescuing my computer partner. Yeah. So that's not horrible. And when you do two players on the same team, it goes in split screen right down the middle. That's good. The arenas are huge. Now, normally, I wouldn't complain about huge <laughs> battlefields, but this is literally just four people getting into a fight. Yeah. I don't need to have an area the size of a pretty large level on, like, a PlayStation 2 game. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it is. Like, these levels are... Like, a, like an avenue block. Big, oh, like, they, heard, like, I would say there's an entire downtown to actually fight in one of these games. Wow. And it it's really, like, the, the gameplay breaks down to dash into your enemy, whoever gets off a good combo and hit first knocks them further away from them, dash up to reach up to, the, to their tumbling body, and then try to punch them into a corner until they're dead. And that's uh, it. And if you're a character that doesn't have a projectile, you're kind of uh, at a loss. No. So Luffy's one of the most powerful characters in the game, if he can get a hit. <laughs> I mean, which is weird. The online is solid. It plays well. It plays at 30 frames per second. It's just 
extremely underwhelming for what should be massively uh, just this bombastic experience. Yeah. And everybody character, every character plays the same. There's a jump button, a weak attack button, a heart attack button, and a special button. Every character has three special attacks. They just hit the O button, forward plus the O button, or jump and then the O button. That sucks. They just it, really it, just plugged in uh, a template and, you know. Which, sideline, is also my complaint for the 3DS Dragon Ball Z fighting game that came out this year. Yeah. Where everybody has the exact same moveset, so it doesn't feel like anybody's different from one another. No. And that's what they did for this. And honestly... Uh, it doesn't matter who you play It doesn't as. matter who you play as. It gets very boring and repetitive. And then when you go through the story mode, you're stuck with a certain set of characters. Yeah. And you have to play with those certain set of characters. And that gets boring. And then they want you to fully complete the story mode, do that four times with four sets of characters. Yeah. No thank you. Pass. <laughs> uh, hard pass on that. So, next is a game that is on the 3DS. Either the game by itself, or it comes with an amiibo. And that's Chibi Robo Ziplash, mm -hmm. which is kind of a clever title because he's, he's got he's got his his plug in his butt and it zips up into his back and he lashes with. Ah, uh, that's adorable. Um, the and game has slightly inappropriate. Way. It, the game has fun elements, but it is also <laughs> really really flawed by some weird design choices. So imagine if Nintendo made Bionic Commando. Mm. Um, only Rad Spencer could jump a little, and hitting people with your claw could kill them. Like, that, that sounds yeah. solid, right? All right, cool. Um, well, that's but. the same core mechanic in Chibi Robo. Yeah. And he's a three-point... He's had... This is his fourth game. He's a established character in Nintendo since the GameCube days now. Yeah. He is a 3.9-inch tall robot. And in the past, his games convey that size with his sense of scale. So your world would be like a den or living room or a kitchen and you're this big <laughs> you're this big and you're wandering around these huge levels which are like, this game doesn't convey that at all it makes some really weird design choices in terms of levels it's a side scroller which i would sit here and think as a side scroller this big you can still do things that give him his world and yeah. have him move around in it but it doesn't do that some of them are really generic to the point where they seem like they were beta testing a level, and they're like, no, no, release that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Like, for some reason, there's an Egyptian temple level. Just apropos of nothing. Just apropos of nothing. <laughs> and because it's everything isn't out of scale, like trying to get up one step of this temple doesn't take anything. You just jump. It's like, oh. And okay. all the enemies are in scale to you, with the exception of bosses. Yeah. So it's like, well, how big am I actually? <laughs> yeah. Like, am I an action figure? Am I a G.I. Joe doll? Am I a person-sized robot? And the only thing that gives you a sense of scale is when you pick up the uh, the advertising tie-in items that are hidden everywhere, like spicy hot Cheetos or Oreos. Or Japanese and German candies that I can neither pronounce nor have heard of. Uh -huh. So it's weird that they've had corporate sponsorship in this game, but they've had the other one as well. But in this case, it's the only thing that conveys a sense of scale. Yeah. And it's. Which really makes it look like it's the only thing they thought about. It does. And so the levels are all right. I mean, the Nintendo platforming, they know how to do that, and it's done well. But the most confusing thing of all is how you select stages. Yeah. Each world has six stages and then there's like six worlds. Why for the life of me did they make stage selection on a roulette wheel? Which can skip you several levels ahead. Now if this were a simple beat the world, you know, yeah. beat, once you go through one six, you beat the world, you move on to the next one, that might be fine, but you can't do that. You have to beat every stage to move on to the next world. That's horrible. And it's on a roulette wheel. That's horrible. And it's not like ones and twos is only. No, we're talking like numbers like fours and fives pop up. 
So you can completely lap a level and end up back to the level you just played in. No, my. Why would they do so that? what you have to do, well, you see, you pick up currency in the game. Yeah. And what you can do is you can go out to the roulette wheel, shop, buy up a bunch of ones, put them on the roulette wheel, and then roll the wheel so that you can go on to the next stage. This sounds like an unfinished game. Well, the thing is, it's like, why did they implement that? Yeah. You put time like, and yeah. effort yeah. to put that in. It, it sounds like it's not finished. It sounds and like it, an unfinished idea. Well, I don't even understand why. Like, I could see that idea working if you didn't have to complete every level to move on. But yeah. you have to. Yeah, that just Why sucks. am I going to replay a level that I just fun. played? It's not fun. Especially if I completed it 100%. Yeah. Which means not getting hit, finding all the hidden items. Yeah. Like perfecting it. Doing a perfect job. And like, I've done that already. Why am I doing it again? It's just really poorly implemented. That's terrible. And the amiibo support on it is that it has its own amiibo that you can level up to get basically invincibility. Mm. Great. So, um, with that, my, my last disappointment is Animal Crossing. <laughs> Amiibo Festival. This game was $60 at launch. And I've seen it on sale up in, like the week before Christmas on Amazon for $35. It's too fucking expensive. It... So the game was created for one reason, and that was to sell Amiibo toys. I like Amiibo. I have a full Smash Brothers collection of Amiibo. I even have the Yarn Yoshis. I like Amiibo, I like their momentation, I like how they're used in multiple games. Animal Crossing Amiibo don't work in multiple games. And their functionality in the game that they are the namesake of is ridiculous. See, Animal Crossing at Amiibo Festival is a board game. I would say it's like Mario Party, but you don't play a mini game afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's literally like playing the game of life. In that you roll the dice, you move your character, and you either get extra money or happiness, or lose money or happiness, and you move around the board over the course of a month. Occasionally, some bonusy things happen, like the turn-up market where you can buy and sell turn-ups to get extra money. It's you know, your fortune can change instantly. Yeah. Several times I lost a game because my buddy rolled the dice and landed on a tree or ran out of space that gave him a tree that gave him 90,000 bells, which means he instantly won the game. <laughs> and because there's no way you can possibly catch up at certain points. So it's like, oh, okay, so there's an instant win button that pops up occasionally. Awesome. And it's random. And, you know, Unlike the game of life where, you know, you can land on certain spaces and know what's going to happen. That doesn't happen. They're all random. And sometimes the game makes it like reverse day. So you go backwards. Sometimes it does opposite day. Where if you land on a good space, it'll take away stuff from you. If you land on a bad space, it'll give you stuff. It, it, what makes it worse is the functionality of the toys in this game. All they do is roll the dice. See, in any other game, this would be a button press. Like, the A button. They don't do that here. The, you have to tap your character onto the gamepad and then lift it off to roll the dice. That's it. And these things, you get two when you buy the console. You get, or buy the game. You get mm -hmm. two. But if you want to play with four people, let's say you find three other people that want to play this piece of crap game with you. Or you want to end a friendship. Or you want to end a friendship. You have to spend at least $25 to get two more figures. Because mm. they can't just pick up the controller and roll. That's ridiculous. I don't understand this. It And the game itself is so boring. It puts the board in board game. <laughs> and what's really tragic about this is that originally it was going to be a free download title. Where to play it, you had to buy a figurine. Yeah. And I wish they had stuck with that plan, because then I would have only had to pay $13 to find out it was a piece of shit. 
Yeah. <laughs> wow, they went, I don't know, they went off the road with that. They did. So, I'm sorry. That's... Did Mario make her so good? Splatoon, Splatoon was such a good experience. I mean, the Smash Brothers DLC, that's always been great. Yeah. Why did they screw up so bad on this? Lack of oversight. I don't know. It's weird, because you see good good and bad things come out of one company in the same calendar year, and you're like, what? Who was making these decisions? Because these, this yeah. stuff over here was great. I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. We're going to wrap up, guys. Uh, that was our best and worst uh, 2015. What you should get, what's worth paying for, and what you should avoid like the play. Yeah. Why don't so, but we also that? have some uh, some backlog. So mm -hmm. I have a ton of games that I have only just started or haven't even, <laughs> haven't even touched yet. But what were yours? I, mean, I, th I think we can both agree. Games that were released on PlayStation Plus. Yeah. That's pretty much going to be on both of our lists. Yeah. Um, for me, I have Bloodborne. Uh, I have Transformers Devastation, which is by Platinum. They haven't made a terrible game, so yeah. look forward to it. Um, I want to finish up Devil May Cry 4, mm -hmm. PS4 edition. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I picked up Devil's Third. I've played a little bit of it. Yeah. It's the only game I played where you can shoot someone in their head and a f their foot flies off. What? <laughs> I know. So, um, made from the same magnificent director that brought you Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive. <laughs> All right. I am looking forward to Wait, it. Wait, the Itagaki? The Itagaki. Oh, wow. I feel oh, like boy. every time you say Itagaki, it's got to be followed up with that Mexican guitar riff. <laughs> 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 yeah. So yeah, basically all the PS Plus games that I haven't gotten around to. Uh, there's way too many to name. Infamous First Light. Uh, I still need to play that. And a lot of these games you can beat in an afternoon or two, and I still am just like mm, looking over my shoulder. Um, Super Meat Boy, um, Super Time Force Ultra. I had started Super Time Force Ultra, and I just you know. Haven't had time, been busy. Same. <laughs> um, I still haven't had time to play Valiant Hearts. That came out on, I think it came out on Plus this year. It came out on Plus this year, but it came out twenty came out last year, yeah. And I love it. Yeah, you should get. I heard it. it. I heard it was <laughs> good. So uh, too many games to play, but the bright on the bright side, I I will stay entertained until Street Fighter Five comes out, which I've been excited for. Hey, and, you only got to wait a month. <laughs> and, you know. Only, what, uh, 40, 42 sleeps, 43 sleeps until <laughs> Street Fighter V. It's, fighting, it's a fighting game, fans, Christmas. God bless us, everyone. Mm. So, Pete? Uh, for me, I mean, 2015 was kind of a rough year, personally and professionally. Pretty good for games. Rough for me. Uh, but I think it ended very well. Good. Force Awakens help. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's so good. Uh, I think there's a lot to look forward to, culturally speaking, mm -hmm. in, in 2016. Um, but between school and Street Fighter Five owning my soul, it was nice knowing everybody. Um, yes. Hashtag SF Dan for five. Hashtag SF Dan for five. Hashtag SF Dan for five. <laughs> All right, you guys. This is it for a Zenny saved January second. 2016. Until next time, play hard and save your money.